I have a confession to make this morning. <laughs> there are weeks that as I'm preparing for a sermon, I read the lessons that are coming up and, and do my study. There are weeks that I'm tempted to think that these lessons, these stories, these readings have precious little to do with real life. And my confession is this week was one of those weeks. If you listen to the Gospel of John, we're reading stuck in the middle of an argument. Stuck in the middle of an argument between Jesus and a crowd of people that have been following him around and listening to him talk about bread from heaven and listening to his, well, confusing and honestly somewhat grotesque proclamation about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Now, biblical scholars some a thousand years ago and some alive today have said that the reason for these verses is a controversy that raged in the early church while John was still alive uh, about the nature and importance of communion, of the Lord's Supper. And John, in writing this, is attempting to settle uh, this controversy. But even as I went back and I read some of the work of those scholars and I learned more about that early controversy, I still wanted to scream, so what? What does all this talk about flesh and blood and heavenly bread and even the Lord's Supper, what does it really have to do with the ins and the outs and the ups and the downs of everyday life? What does it have to do with our hopes and our fears and our loves and our hates and our living and our dying? What does it have to do with us here and now, 2,000 years later, as we struggle to make ends meet week to week. See, the thing is, when I open the Bible, I'm not looking for academic or theological controversies to enter into. I'm not interested in that even a little bit. What I'm looking for is for guidance and comfort in dealing with life here right now. And I'm also looking for meaning. Not meaning in the way of trying to understand something that I don't understand, but meaning in, in a way that, that's more, what is it that makes this life worth living right now? And so, just like the crowd in the lesson, when I hear Jesus seemingly abstract words about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, I get a little frustrated because it seems like what we really need is something a little more concrete, a little more meaningful. The people in our lesson that were there in front of Jesus said, how can this man give us his flesh? In other words, they're saying, Jesus, we want the same thing. We're looking for something a little more concrete. Can you give us something a little more real? We're not looking for some great metaphor, for some empty, abstract promise. And in response to their demand, Jesus says both to them and I think to us here this morning, he says, I'm telling you the truth. If you do not, do not eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. And suddenly, upon hearing those words, we realize... Well, I think we realized, and the crowd back then realized, 
he's serious. He really means this whole eat my flesh and drink my blood thing. And upon hearing it, the crowd there in Capernaum, they draw back because it doesn't square at all with what they have been taught by the law and the prophets. In fact, what they've been taught by the law and the prophets is that something like he's talking about, eating flesh and drinking blood, is an abomination. And we shrink back just a little bit, too, because it doesn't square with our reason. And if we're being honest with ourselves, it sounds kind of gross. Think about it for just a minute. When is the last time you really thought about the words that we use every Sunday at each celebration of the Lord's Supper? I read a story a while back about a church that was probably very much like ours, and they were having a communion service. The table was draped in linen, and the silver uh, trays and plates were there. There was a crystal flagon full of wine, and the congregation sat quietly as the pastor said those words that we're so used to hearing. This is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you. At which point a little girl, probably having paid attention in service for the first time in her life, suddenly and quite loudly said, Oh, yuck! And the congregation, as you might imagine, looked horrified. They looked as if someone had just splattered the altar with blood, which in effect is just what the little girl had done with her exclamation. For four weeks now, the gospel lesson has been in the sixth chapter of John. And here, finally, at the end of the chapter, we encounter the heart of it all. In these verses, we finally begin to realize just what is at stake for Jesus, how much we are worth to him. In these verses, he offers us his very own body and blood. The flesh which will be stretched upon the cross for our sake. The blood which will run down freely from his hands and his feet and his side also for our sake. And for four weeks hearing this gospel, we've struggled to understand, just like the people that were following him around, what Jesus means by speaking of the bread of life and the food from heaven. So here, at the end of the chapter, he makes himself very clear. The imagery that he uses gets very graphic because he wants us to understand. He wants to confront us with the claim and the promise of a God who becomes incarnate, a God who takes on flesh, a God who becomes just like us in order that we would live with him eternally. For in Jesus Christ, the word made flesh, and in the holy sacrament that we will celebrate in just a few moments, we meet the God who will be satisfied with nothing less than our whole selves. This is why Jesus speaks of giving us his flesh and blood, because in the Hebrew language, flesh and blood is an idiom which refers to the whole person. Heart, mind, spirit, feelings, hopes, dreams, fears, concerns, everything. And in Jesus, the totality of God meets us to love, redeem, and sustain the totality of who we are. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Throughout the Gospel of John, we encounter some of the most familiar images describing the relationship of Jesus 
and those who believe in him. Jesus is the shepherd. We are the sheep. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. Jesus abides in God, and we abide in Jesus. In this passage, however, the language is pressed to the limits to express the union and participation of his life in ours. When we receive Jesus, his life clings to our bones and courses through our veins. And he can no more be taken from our lives than last Tuesday's breakfast can be taken from our bellies. This is the promise that God makes to us in holy communion. To be with us and for us forever. To stick with us and, yes, even in us forever no matter what. Each and every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, God comes to us again to offer us the promise made so concrete and so solid that we can touch it and we can feel it and we can taste it and we can eat it. Here in these common physical elements, we have God's promise that he not only cares about our births, and our deaths, and our jobs, and our marriages, and our successes, and our failures. Not only does he care about those things, but he actually joins with us in them. He has joined his own self to us through Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, and given for us. Now, a few short moments. We'll have the incredible opportunity to take part in Holy Communion. So come. Come and eat and drink this promise. Come prepared to meet the God who has come to meet you exactly where you are. Come and receive the real food of Christ's body and the real drink of his blood that you might have his support in this real and very difficult world that we live in. Finally, come. Come to meet the God who offers us not just meaning, but eternal life in his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. What a beautiful-